Who's going? I'm going. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Hello. workshop. Our, our Mastering the MMI Mystery Workshop. It's this mystery surrounding the MMI. I'm Dr. Ryan Gray. I suppose I'll be your moderator for today, hanging out, um, talking about the MMI with my two lovely um, co-hosts, co-moderators, co-presenters, uh, Rachel Grubbs, a co-founder at MAPT, MCAT pre-med expert for 20 plus years. How you doing, Rachel? Hello, I'm great. I'm excited to be here. Help wow. everybody think through the trickiness that is the multiple mini interview. Yes. Or is there trickiness? Oh, Ooh. that is the question. Dr. Scott Ooh. Wright, former director of admissions at UT Southwestern, retired executive director at TMDSAS, all around cool guy. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How's it going with all of you two and everybody else out there? I'm well, it is less than 100 degrees in Austin, <laughs> Texas today, and I am happy. <laughs> it's 99.9, .9, but it's less than 100. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's I don't actually right. know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's something. It's yeah, something. Right. Uh, well, awesome. Uh, as you all are joining, uh, Rachel already put a little comment there to change your chat from hosts and panelists to everyone. And then the first thing we would like you to do after doing that is to say hello. Let us know where you are watching from and whether or not you are in the current application cycle. That would be a good one. Uh, looks like we have a, a special guest with us, Ellen Miller. If that's the same Ellen Miller who's going to be at MAPTCon, I would love to say hello, Ellen. Um, hello. Yeah, so let's uh, let's rock and roll. Amber from Vermont, applying now. Have my first interview on Monday. Wonderful. Woohoo! Woo Ellen says hello. Beatrice says New Jersey and in the current application cycle. Anna from Jersey. Muhammad from New York. Uh, they're coming fast and furious now. Sydney from Atlanta. Hello. Applying now. Tiffany. Sacramento in the current application cycle. Uh, Meg from wow. Salt Lake City. First interviews tomorrow. All kinds of people. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and saying hi. And hopefully you'll be able to learn something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's rock and roll. Do, do, do. Y'all have the mastering the MMI mystery up. Whoa. Yes. All right. <laughs> so yeah, this is a part of a free workshop series we do regularly. So um, at least once a month, some months, twice a month, we get together and try to dissect some part of the pre-med process. So it's usually seasonal, right? We're doing master the MMI mystery today because we are in uh, full on interview season now that it's September. And Although this specifically says MMI, the multiple mini interview, which we'll talk about a little bit, the truth is it's also just about ethics-based questions, which can show up in any interview. So situational yep. judgment, um, that'll, that's something you'll get asked about on the CASPER, scenarios, professionalism, those kinds of competencies, they can come up in any interview, not just the MMI. Yep. Yes, they can. It's true, it is true. Uh, so we have this application timeline here. A lot of you wrote that you're already in it, so you know. This is not to scale, right? This timeline is 18 months, so please notice. <laughs> I'm kind of pointing here at the second to the right. This is a long period. Um, I've already heard from many people who have said, I got my secondaries in and I thought I'd feel relieved, and now I just feel super worried because I don't have anything to do and I'm just waiting on interviews. So if you've already had an interview, if you have an invite in the next week or two, we are super proud and excited for you. But if you don't have one yet, you're in the normal. That's how yep. most people are at this point. Yep. Uh, so if that's the case, Ryan, if they could get interviews anytime between now and May, why prep now? Uh, why not is the answer. Uh, because the goal is to be prepared for your interview not to get your interview and then rush to prepare. So mm -hmm. I would uh, make sure that you you just understand this process, understand the um, uh, understand the interview style and all of that stuff, and then get into it. Um, I think a lot of students think that 
interview prep has to be school specific. And so they wait for an interview to then go, okay, I have a school. I know where, uh, ha- uh, where I'm going to be interviewing. So therefore I'm ready to prep and let me go do a mock interview. Let me go schedule a mock interview. When in reality, it's only a small part of the interview process is going to be very school specific. And so you can practice big picture. How do I talk about myself? How do I um, talk about why I want to be a doctor? How do I talk about my strengths and weaknesses? How do I talk about all this other stuff that has nothing to do with the school? And then when you get that school specific interview, you go, okay, now I need to prepare. Why do I want to go to the school? Which shocker you should have been doing that already when you made your school list trying to do some of that research uh scott you're shaking your head it seems like you you agree there oh absolutely i think you know the the biggest part of interviews is going to be general to every school they're going to ask uh you know specific questions perhaps about your application or uh, fundamental questions about why medicine or uh, uh what you as a person experience as your strengths and weaknesses or things like that. Whereas a very small portion of the interview is going to be, why do you want to go here? Uh, or how did you get to the conclusion of, of applying to our school? So I completely agree with you, Ryan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so- you know, I, I, I will also say that if you're seeking uh, assistance, like through MAP or through Application Academy or these workshops, that if you wait until, you know, I had a student last week who got a one week notice of an mm-hmm. interview. Yeah. And if you well, wait, welcome if to you the wait, virtual world. Yeah, you know, you're going to, you're, yeah. you're not going to have prep time uh, with any uh, extended uh, ability. Uh, so, you know, doing it ahead of time is a good idea. Yeah, I, I think um, the the virtual kind of environment that we're in now with with interviews, which is a wonderful thing, I think post COVID, because of the reduce um, the reduction in I don't know I don't really like that word, but the costs of travel and hotels mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and all of that stuff um, to travel to uh, an in person interview, you obviously lose some things with the virtual interview, but you save a lot of money. But one of the kind of parts of that that students often don't think about is that that turnaround time from interview invite to actual interview could be a matter of days because they're not expecting you to book flights and book hotel rooms and anything else. It's like, hey, here's an interview invite. Jump on Zoom, right? Call in sick to work or whatever. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. Look at this. Sydney, two business days. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There you go. Right. Wow. Right. So once you find out whether it's open or closed file, once you find out whether it's group or one on one, yeah, that's useful, but it actually doesn't change your practice that much. The main thing it sounds like you're going to do right before a school interview is re research the school, make sure you're why this school is really tight. But so 90, 95% of the interview prep applies to every school. Yeah. Sounds and, like and, a really good reason to start now. And and most <laughs> of it, right? It's not even applies to the school. It applies to just human communication in general, right? Yeah. You're just practicing yeah. Yeah. how to be yeah. normal, as weird as that sounds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how to how to be normal in a very stressful environment. <laughs> Maybe that's the title of this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whatever normal is you know. I was just going to say <laughs> do any of us deserve to be here I'm normal uh, yeah right <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh okay so I think we've we've covered that that thoroughly right yes this is a long interview season yes you should retain hope for a long time and yes you should still prepare as though you're getting an interview any day now. Yep. So what is this MMI? What is a multiple mini interview? <laughs> Scott? Uh, it's uh, <laughs> butt kicking is what it is. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Uh, no, it's the ability for interviewers to see, or, or the school in general, to see how you can perform uh, uh, with very specific prompts 
uh, in a short period of time with with a little preparation. And they're they're trying to see and you're going from one to another quickly. And it gives them an idea of how how you think uh, without a whole lot of prep. You don't know what the questions are going to be, what the scenario might be. Uh, so you don't get a whole lot of prep time, two minutes typically. And, uh, and and then you go and you go into it and you're you're doing the thing and then it cuts off at six, seven, eight minutes. And uh, and you go on to the next uh, to the next one. And so it's a quick way. Uh, it's logistically very uh, time consuming for medical schools to do MMIs because it, it, it requires a lot more interviewers. It requires a lot more uh, effort and stuff. But they 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 feel like some schools, at least, that they get more information out of it uh, about who you are and how you think. Yeah. Oops who you are, how you think, and and the data supposedly shows that uh, there's less bias involved. Um, mm -hmm. a, a traditional interview, typically one, maybe two interviewers. And if you, mm -hmm. you mess up mm -hmm. one or you don't jive with one interviewer, mm -hmm. that's a big part of your evaluation yeah. for that day. And here you have several opportunities to mm -hmm. interact with someone in a more structured, theoretically less ability to be biased way, right? Everyone still has their biases. Um, but theoretically, if you mess up a station, you just need to reset your brain and go, I screwed up. That's okay. I have more opportunities to prove that, that I'm good at this. Yep. Yep. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so hmm. what is the MMI testing? Rachel, what is it testing? Well, according to our handy little graphic here, <laughs> it says it's testing your thought process, communication, and critical thinking more than your knowledge. Let's translate that into what it actually means for you guys prepping. Almost every time I do an MMI or an ethics or a scenario-based practice question with someone, when I do interview feedback, I typically start with, great, let's stop there. How do you think you did? And the most common thing out of the student's mouth is, I don't know, did I answer the question right? There are not definitive right answers for MMI interviews. So I was gonna say for situational judgment tests, but although that's true for the Casper, the preview actually mm -hmm. does make you pick mm -hmm. multiple choice. So boo, <laughs> but in real <laughs> life, right? You aren't given choice A, B, C, D, and D is secretly the accredited answer, right? You just have to use your own mm -hmm. judgment. So mm -hmm. what, you know, another way of putting this here would be show your work. Right. When you're in a higher level math class and calculus, yep. you aren't expected to just say, say, hey, I solved it. I did that differential equation. You're supposed to show how you got there. That's a big part of the MMI is not did I answer it in a way that my interviewer agrees with me or sounds like a future doctor and more did I answer it in a way that showed what I was thinking and what questions I would ask if I were in this situation in real life. And that is so important. That's why it gets his own slide because it's the, I think the most common mistake is what's the secret right answer? Yeah. What if I told you there was no secret right answer? <laughs> I wouldn't believe you. Wrong ones. There is a definitive <laughs> right one. Sorry, bumped my mouth. You know, I now what did you just say, Rachel? That's a key key thing you just might said. be some wrong ones. Correct. There could be some wrong answers if you give like super bizarre. Uh, answer to a, a ethical scenario like mm. yeah let them die whatever you know <laughs> i mean not not nobody would do that in an interview but i mean you get the point it's there are <laughs> some wrong will. directions to go in so just uh you know just uh, uh but i completely agree with you rachel uh if you go into it with the mentality that i've got to have the right answer this is the wrong wrong paradigm to be using yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, Beatrice asks, uh, are the types of MMI stations the same for virtual interviews as well as in, in person? Right? Are role playing and writing stations common? What do you think about that, Rachel? Yeah. I mean, I there, there aren't a ton of virtual MMIs out there, but there are some. And and that's what I've heard is they're just doing virtual equivalents. So sometimes mm -hmm. MMIs are one on one and sometimes it's a group project. You can still do mm -hmm. that group project in the Zoom breakout room. Um, uh, the 
uh, MMI, whether you're in person or virtual, might be you writing a response or might be you verbalizing a response. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of my general attitudes about interviews is I couldn't possibly get you prepped for every single thing that ha could happen, but I do hope to get you into an attitude where you're ready for anything that could happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah. Veronica asks, is there any guess for percentage of schools that hold MMIs? Last I looked, it was about a quarter of the schools. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was going to say 30%. Yeah. It's not right. But again, I think it's more common. So MMI might be 25 or 30, but you're still going to benefit from these kinds of questions because yeah. they get sprinkled yeah. into tra traditional. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's go back here. Uh, all right we kind of just did that <laughs> I, <laughs> I i got ahead of myself i didn't know what the next slide said or i did well i knew i didn't remember so yeah show your work you're gonna have a conversation about why you're doing what so now we still haven't given you an example scenario and we're already telling you questions to ask yourself but there's a reason we're kind of doing it this way Often we find once we give you an example scenario, you start going down the specifics of that, right? If it's a story with a kid who's got mystery bruises, you guys go to Child Protective Services. So while going to authority may be a part of it, <clears throat> start earlier. So walk us mm -hmm. through these questions, Ryan or Scott. Yeah, I'll walk through. Uh, and and for those who who don't know, I I am a physician. I went to medical school. I I practiced as a physician for five years in the Air Force, and a lot of this is very similar to when you're practicing medicine and you have a patient to see. What's this problem? What's my role? Obviously, I know I'm the physician, but is, is there a special role that I need to take here? Is the is this patient asking me to be something or do something? to help them. And a lot of that comes in the the chief complaint when I'm looking at the electronic medical record, right? What's the problem? Why are they here? Why am I seeing them? What what's going on today? Right? What additional information do I need if if uh, I'm looking at their chief complaint, uh, I need to know like they were in the emergency room for a broken bone. Do I do I have an x-ray to look at? Do I have an MRI? Do I have a CT scan? Like what's what's going on here? Um, all right, and I'm giving you the medical equivalent of this, um, but it's very similar process uh, if it's a moral or ethical situation, non-medical type situation. All right, what else could be going on? A, a patient comes in who fell down the stairs. What else could be going on, right? Oh, I'm clumsy. I bumped into a door, right? We we all have these stereotypes of uh, domestic violence that we that that media portrays, uh, television, movies, etc. But is is that something I need to think of? What else could be going on? Is this person here with their spouse? Do I need to separate them? Is, am I concerned about child abuse? Do I need to separate the the parent and the child? What else could be going on here? Right? Uh, where do I stand on the issue? Uh, if this is a, a, a again, I, I'm giving the medical version of this. Um, if, if this is a patient that I've seen a bunch and they're back again for the same thing, where do I stand? Am I frustrated? Do I need to check my biases? Do I need to try to clear the slate? So like, what's what's going on here? Uh, potential issues with my stance in terms of my thought process of, of what I'm about to walk into. What I, I again, checking my biases. Uh, have I thought about this? What's whether what's the repercussion? What's the downstream effect? of my thinking. And a lot of this stuff, I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, but a lot of this stuff, you're going to be explaining to the interviewer that's in the room. You're going to be talking about, well, I thought about this, but I'm worried about that. And because of that, I might do something a little different, but then there are these other things, right? And again, as, as Rachel, you mentioned, right, the whole show your work part of this process, you're giving that interviewer a lot of material to go, great, you're thinking about all of the right stuff. You may have come to a different conclusion than uh, than most students have come to, but I'm not going to mark you off because you have thought about all of the right things. Mm -hmm. So, and then my favorite one here, and again, this is the best for that clinical um, kind of medicine scenario is, is if this is a role-playing scenario, if I can tell from what I'm reading that there's going to be a person that I'm going to be role playing with. 
what is their state of mind going to be? And this is exactly the same thing you do with patients in the exam room. And a lot of times your medical assistant will will kind of clue you into that of like, hey, Mr. Jones is here and he is irate, all right, or whatever. And so you prepare yourself for a very angry person on the other side of that door. Um, are are they going to be crying? Are they going to be scared? Are they going to be angry? What's what's going on there? Mm-hmm. So lots of things to, to ask yourself. Hopefully framing it in that clinical way gives you a little bit uh, a better idea of potentially how to think about approaching these scenarios. Yep. Yeah. And we'll kind of come back to this list as we do some actual role playing here in a little bit. Um, so we touched on this briefly. One of the big perks of the MMI is instead of one person being biased about you for 30 minutes, nine people are going to be biased about you. Wait, how's that better? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because it's spread out, right? So if, if Ryan has a predilection to like people who also make podcasts, but I have a predilection to like people who also read a lot, right? <laughs> like then when you meet each of us, you kind of get more, more chances to have someone who's on your wavelength or at least not bringing any, any unintentional bias to the conversation that could infect you in a negative way. So just generally more chances for you to be yourself and strike a chord with someone. Mm-hmm. So we see this as a good thing. Yep. Okay. You guys ready for some example scenarios? Love it. So do we want to uh, do one of these sort of as a group? We want to volunteer someone? How do you want to structure this? Uh, Yeah, let's ask for someone who wants to volunteer. All right. So if you would like to take a crack at doing a practice uh, interview question with us, raise your hand. You can go to the reaction section of your um, on your menu bar and click the raise hand icon. <laughs> Looks like, oh, wait, yeah, Muhammad's feeling brave. Looks like Muhammad's up. Woohoo, way to go, Muhammad. I'm going to allow you to talk. So you now have permissions to talk. You'll need to unmute whenever you're ready, Muhammad. Um, so, let's do the interviewer-based one instead of actor-based. Okay. Yeah, good idea. Muhammad, you want to say hi just to be sure we can hear you? Uh, yes. Can you, Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yep. Welcome. All right. So I'll read this out loud so the whole audience can hear. So we're doing the interview-based side here, Muhammad. One of your coworkers, a surgeon, let it slip that his vision is deteriorating from a rare eye condition that will likely leave him blind. He has two kids and a wife at home, wife who stays at home. He has told you that he doesn't plan on telling his employer because he needs to work and pay off his student loans and other bills. What concerns do you have? How would you go about helping your friend? Enter the room and discuss with the interviewer. Okay. Um, should I have a minute just to think about it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do. Do you want to potentially uh, ease Mohammed into this and go back to the questions that we just covered? Yeah, I think that's a great idea, just to help him and everyone kind of wrap their brain yeah. around it. So uh, I I posted the question in the chat, so you can still look at the question. Uh, it's format a little wonky, just the way I, I copied it, but. Um, so, Mohammed, you see the the prompt is still there in the chat. Uh, let's talk through each of these questions. Go ahead and just talk through each of these questions. What's the problem? What's my role, et cetera? Okay. Um, so, in terms of what the problem is, um, I have a coworker or you know a fellow surgeon whose um, eye condition is deteriorating, leaving him blind. But of course, he is concerned that he may potentially lose his job or be able to lose or be able to lose his ability to uh, conduct surgery. And that's a major concern since of course he needs to be able to pay off his student loan and of course be able to survive uh, with his family. Um, So he wants to keep this a secret. And of course I have to make a decision to figure out what to do about it. Um, So I guess my role is sort of just as a colleague um, what am I supposed to do in this stance? Uh, what am I supposed to do in this case? And if I should take a stance against him or, you know, talk to him about it and really figure out maybe a middle ground or maybe figure out a solution to this problem. Um, I guess any additional information I do need is maybe how severe this medical condition is and how much this can impact the surgery. 
um, of course, I want to kind of kind of get into try to understand what else in terms of what else could be going on. Um, you know, is there any sort of psychosomatic or any kind of mental health aspect of it that could potentially have um, something to do with this eye condition? So that's something that I want to take into consideration. Um, and in terms of where I stand on this issue, I think what I would probably do is I would try to uh, pull my colleague aside and I would really talk about how, um, you know, first I want to really understand what his concerns are. Um, so of course he does, he does talk about like his family and he does talk about, of course, paying off his student loans. And I do want to understand that. Um, but of course, at the same time, I want to also tell him that this is um, a huge risk for patients and that this can compromise the safety of patients. So that's something that I do want to um, discuss with him that, you know, you know, it's probably a good idea to talk to the employer to really um, figure out if there's anything else you could probably do. Um, in terms of potential issues with my stance, I think that this could potentially uh, get him fired from his job, which I think is a huge concern. But I do think that, you know, under, that, you know, caring about patient safety, I think is really an important priority. So I think that you know, talking to him about it is probably first and foremost the right decision before going to an employer. Um, and in terms of if it's an actor in scenario, what state of mind would you be in? Um, I think I would try my best to be empathetic. I think that's kind of the state of mind I would probably be in. No, the the actor. It's the actor. So so let let's assume this was the actor based one for for this specific question. Yeah. The the person who potentially has the eye issue, what state of mind might they be in? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yes. Um so in terms of what state of mind they'd be in, I think they'd probably I f I feel like they would probably be in a lot of stress and a lot of worry at that point. Um you know, so I feel like they they're incredibly concerned about, you know, being able to perform you know, you know, being able to conduct surgeries. And also I'm sure that they're concerned about losing their job. So I'm sure he's feeling a lot of uh, distress and a lot of mental health anxiety. So I think that's a huge part that can, um, that's something to really take into consideration. Uh, so based off that, I think, um, like I kind of mentioned earlier, my approach would probably be to approach him in an empathetic way and really get to, um, but also at the same time, still discuss um, the patient safety issue part of it. Mm -hmm. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, Muhammad, you, you really traced through the questions well, and you, you brought up issues that I think are incredibly relevant. Um, you know, what I like to do with, um, you know, what I like to do with these, with these scenarios, whether it's an acting based scenario or it's just, uh, you know, you're just discussing it with the interviewer is I like, I like for you to be able to, if at all possible, help to create with, with the interviewer, a mental image for them of what your behavior is going to look like in this situation. <laughs> in other words, uh, you know, I think you're right, you know, really approaching your friend, uh, your colleague with a, a, a deep sense of empathy, uh, uh, compassion, concern, uh, what, you know, I, I'm here to help you. Um, in other words, I, I would, you know, kind of enter into a discussion with the interviewer by saying, you know, I'm going to, number one, first and foremost, I'm going to be concerned for my friend, for my mm -hmm. colleague, uh, the stress that they're under the the uh, difficulties that they're going to be facing in care for their family because if you think about it the a number one thing this person that this colleague is is concerned about is how am i going to provide for my family you know i have spent 10 years preparing myself to be a surgeon and now i'm not going to be able to do it anymore what's going to happen what what you know the wheels are falling off their life and you want to be there to uh, speak compassion into the situation and to help care for them as much as possible and really helping the interviewers see that by saying things like, you know, I'm going to choose to uh, uh, talk to my friend 
in a, uh, a, a discreet place, a private place where we can maybe really get a good situ a good discussion going. I'm going to sit down beside them if it's appropriate, maybe put my hand on their shoulder and just, how are you? What, you know, tell me, you know, tell me what's going on. Just really show the interviewer this deep sense of compassion that you have for your, for your friend. Uh, and then you kind of can go into other parts of it in terms of the patient safety issue and, and kind of, uh, you know, what conclusions you might come to about what you might want to do, but helping the interviewer to see in their mind's eye, what what your activity is going to be looking like what what's going to be a number one in your concern uh of uh with this uh with this uh, situation does that make sense yeah absolutely i think you brought up some very good points i appreciate it so brian if 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 scott and muhammad were doing that where where could there be potential issues with that stance or that style like where would this question be a real troubleshoot shoot or trouble yeah. spot for someone yeah, so it's I have seen students who interpret this. I don't know if it's an interpretation issue or a this is what I'm supposed to do issue, right? Yeah. Scott, you you had mentioned a ton empathy, empathy, empathy. A lot of students forget the empathy part and go, right. "Oh, I know what the problem is here. This mm -hmm. is a patient safety issue and this is against the Hippocratic oath." And my job is to go prove to this person that what they're doing is wrong, immoral, illegal, unethical, against the Hippocratic Oath, and I'm going to get them to stop at all costs. And I have had plenty of mock interviews that I've done with students. They come yeah. in with this attitude, and I, as the actor, just immediately shut down because yep. they don't care about me. They right. care about proving that what they think I'm doing is wrong. And, yeah. and you're not going to get anywhere in life with that attitude. Yeah. Yep. Um, which and isn't you, to say well. that's that's not feedback to you, Muhammad. That's like yeah. what happens yeah. if you take yeah. that tack. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. And see, if I was if I was the actor in that situation, I would say, mind your own business. Yep. You know, mind your own business. You, know, uh -huh. you take care of you. I'll take care of me. This will be fine. I'm an adult. You know, I'd shut down too. You're, you're exactly yeah. right. Yeah, where I and I think kind of Ryan, what you're getting at. So for students, if you're still looking at the slide, this fifth bullet point, a lot of people jump right to where do I stand? And I think many of you have been trained, oh, where you stand is go tell authority. And sure, there are going to be times that that's what you have to do under the law, but kind of to the point that Scott and Ryan are making, what's going to get the desired result? Yes, of course, we're very worried about the patients, but what additional information do we need here? Mm -hmm. His eyes deteriorating. How fast, right? Yeah, My mother got told two years ago she's going to need cataract surgery sometime in the next 10 years. She <laughs> still fine to drive. Yeah. We're just keeping an eye on it, right? Yeah. She's not taking anyone's life into her hands by driving. This surgeon might be having something similar. Like yep. maybe they're going to be able to do really quality work for years. Um, so let's find out how fast this is going. If it is going quickly, is there a way he could consult on surgeries without doing the surgeries, right? Like, can we find a solution that allows for empathy for this person? Scott, I think what you said was like the wheels are coming off his life, right? He trained his entire life to be an eye surgeon or be a surgeon. And now he, I don't know why I said eye surgeon. And now he, now he may not be able to see, right? Like heartbreak. Yep. Or could be she, right? Um, yeah. So allowing them some space to grieve and also understanding, yes, of course, they want to take care of their patients. They took the same oath you did. You don't have to remind them. Um, but what can we do to both save their family and save their patients? Like, is there a win somewhere that is a win for everyone? Yeah. The, the best way almost always to go into almost any MMI scenario or a traditional interview that happens to be kind of around morals and ethics and stuff or team-based stuff, working with other people, it's almost always to first ask questions. Mm -hmm. What is going on here? How can I help? How are you, right? What do you know? What do you not know, right? Just asking questions, gathering information instead of assuming I know what I need to do here. Mm -hmm. Mm 
<laughs> like a little laser pointer. Little red laser pointer. I, These I two. Like That's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I wanted to highlight them, but I was like, I'll just laser point it. Yeah. These two. I think you want to spend a lot of time on these two or sorry, these two additional information. Do I need what else could be going on? Yeah. Spend out a lot of time here before you go to this. And then again, even with this. And when we say potential issues, we don't mean, are you going to get in trouble? It's, are you going to get the desired result? Um, yeah. And like Ryan said, yeah. so often it's, I'm going to explain to them what they did is wrong. Like people know smoking is bad for you. They still smoke. <laughs> like educating them is probably not the right answer at this point. Right. right? That's right. It's probably about right. feelings, not facts. Yeah. And okay. I, I, I want to point something out in, in terms of the actor based scenario. Uh, you know, if this is an acting scenario, one thing you have to remember because often I think what students do is they want to ease into it. They, you know, they do a lot of chit chat up front. Hey, how's it going? What's happening? How's your family? Blah, blah, blah. And they spend a minute or two on the chit chat part. And before they ever get to the real issue, you know, you only got six minutes here. And if you're spending a third of it, uh, chit chatting on what did you you know what did you do last night at the you know at the what at the party or whatever that you know that's all lost it's irrelevant and so you've got to quickly ease into the point that you're there to address uh, often pre med students and even medical students in my experience that takes time to fit, to to get to a point where you can just say hey we need to talk about this you know let's you know, I got something I want to talk to you about instead of, you know, kind of being afraid to address the issue. Yeah. So got to kind of get to the point. Good point. Yeah. All right. Should we do another one? Heck yeah. Yeah. Trolley car. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite scenario. <laughs> All right. So someone volunteer. Or you'll be voluntold, as we like to say. Um, Ooh, nobody's volunteering. Come on, friends. You guys came to practice, to learn. No better time. Yeah, Jump in. Right. Free interview prep. Right. I mean, I think if you're feeling trepidatious, I think the thing to remember is it's going to be a lot scarier when it's actually your med school admission on the line. So even though it can be hard to do this in front of peers, we are here to help you be better on the real day. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. All right. If no one's going to raise their hand, we should just uh oh somebody raised their hand hey mitchell there we go i was gonna say we'll just end hey, early <laughs> way to go mitchell <laughs> all right i'll get mitchell to allow to talk here there you go hello everybody hello hello uh ryan do you want to paste that in and i can go back to the questions for mitchell uh yeah i would love mitchell um to make it a little more streamlined as well and not just question by question but we we'll uh put the uh, questions back up. We'll give you the question cheat sheet. Yeah, don't walk through it one by one like we had Mohammed, but just see who has it, have it as a reference. So, um, so this is obviously a very difficult situation. You hold either one or five lives in your hands. Um, it's on one hand, by pure math, it's five people versus one. But on the other hand, it's you're making that decision the current decision to change track and that would be taking that life in your own hands. So on, in that scenario, I definitely take the time to think, you know, about my own, you know, sort of stance on that. Cause every time this question is asked a lot of times to a lot of people. And in that situation, I don't think anyone would know what they would do. So in my role as a human being, you know, Taking away five people versus one person is a huge, huge choice. Um, so do it, what I don't know. I'd have to think. What, what if I do nothing? Then I kill five people because I'm currently on a track with five team members. But 
and I'm potentially taking away, I'm impacting negatively five separate families. Um, but on the other hand, if I decide to change the track, I myself am making the conscious decision to, ch to change track. And I'm physically like manipulating the circumstance and I'm taking that life. So some could say. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So personally, I would, in this scenario, just to, you know, it's mid second decision, I would probably. I think I would change track because of the huge impact of five people versus the one person just by even by triage. But still, I would, regardless of the decision, someone's going to lose their life. And I would, I, and that would, of course, negatively impact me, negatively impact the family of the one person or the five people. But in this scenario, I think the impact would be. I wouldn't say less because, of course, it's still a human being, but it's a significantly larger amount of people affected potentially if I if I do nothing and five people, you know, lose their husband, their wife, their mom, their dad. And I'm, that would be my split second decision here. Yeah. So let me let me throw a wrinkle into this scenario, uh, which always be prepared for follow up questions and wrinkles in the scenario. Uh, Mitchell, you are no longer the trolley driver. You are on an overpass witnessing what is happening. Uh, in this modified scenario, there's no change of tracks. There's just the single track. You can see the trolley's out of control. It's going to run into the five people at the end of the track. Next to you uh, is a sufficiently large enough person that if you bump them over the bridge, they will land on the tracks, derailing the trolley car, dying, uh, but saving the five people at the end. Now, you just told me, told us that you would save five people um, and kill, for lack of a better better term, one. Uh, would you kill this one person to save the five in this modified scenario? So I believe in this modified scenario, the manipulation is definitely, uh, definitely significantly different. So in the other scenario, me pulling the lever is a lot different than being face to face with the person, of course, and deciding to physically throw them in the way of the train. And what you one could argue that 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 pulling the lever is the same thing as as that, but by I'd say by human psychology, being face to face with a person and being able to you know at this point commit direct murder, even if it's trying to save five other people, it's definitely more up close and personal, and. I would, and while of course you could argue, like I said, that it's the same decision, it's definitely different on a personal level and a psychological level as a human being. So in this scenario, while while as the train operator, I would change track, just just be, if if I'm face to face with the person, of course I'm not completely sure if I if I would be able to make that decision, especially if they're they're. This is this doesn't have too much to do with it, but they're they net they didn't sign up to be there. They're not a company employee. They're not linked to the company. They didn't they don't they're not in any sense in a liability situ liable situation. They're not on the track. They don't have any expectation of risk in this scenario. Mm. And I'm and I'm not of course not saying that the one per, the people on the track have that makes them have a reason to die or justifies it, but I think mm. it's a much different choice here. So in this scenario, I personally don't think I would push the person into the tracks to save the lives of the other five, just because of the human basis of, you know, being face to face with a person, it's a lot more difficult. And also on the other contributing factors, such as employment, expectation of risk and uh, yeah. Rachel, you had a lot of facial expressions to everything Mitchell was saying. What do you, what do you think there? Yeah. I mean, I think the point about, um, I mean, hopefully people who work on trains don't expect to die. Right. But, but I think that you, you're right to admit it's a lot easier to say, I'm going to kill the one when you're pulling a lever. And that leaves this sort of sliver of hope of maybe they'll get out of the way. Maybe it's not really my fault. It's the train's fault. Right. So I think you're right to admit just physically even if it is essentially the same, it feels very different, which is, by the way, part of why we ask these questions is because 
people tend to knee jerk with solutions that would be hard to implement in real life, right? So Brian asked the follow up to make you think about it's one thing to say I would call CPS. And it's another thing to stare some dude who's eight inches taller than you in the eye and say, I'm calling child protective services because of the bruises on your child's body. Right. And so the same thing with trolley, right? Like it's, it's putting, it's putting your money where your mouth is. So I think you're right to admit, right. And it, it may make you question, what am I actually doing with the lever after all? Is it that different? But I think it's good that you know that that would feel differently to you. And I do think you made a good point that this is a bystander. So there is a, um, they had no expectation of risk that day. <laughs> So you made good points. Self-aware. Yeah. Awesome. Good job, Mitchell. Yeah, excellent work. You are accepted. <laughs> 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 to our fake university. Yeah, and what's, what was really great about Mitchell's response is he didn't try to convince me he was right or us that he was right. Yep. He didn't try to argue with us. When Ryan made the scenario a lot harder, he didn't get defensive. Right. And a lot of what we just want to learn is how do you act when you're on the spot? And yeah. I mean, we could tell know, Mitchell was thinking out loud, but that was good yeah. because we were understanding yeah. how he was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And he also didn't try to figure out some cheap way to alter the situation. Well, I don't have my phone, but I have a walkie talkie. Yeah. yeah, or so, you know, so maybe Veronica... I'll, I'll drive my car onto the, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. tracks or, you know, whatever. Yeah. What, what I typically say there is don't fight the scenario, right? The scenario is written specifically for that way. So Veronica, to your question, could you ask a follow-up of whether a horn or whistle is working? So yes, you can ask a lot of follow-up questions, but if you go and read this scenario, it's written very specifically that says uh, you have no way of warning the team members. Yeah. The scenario answers that for you. And so if you were to ask that question, I would assume you didn't read the scenario fully. Yeah. And obviously there's some leeway, right? We understand students are under stress and maybe you miss a small detail. I'm the king of missing small details, as Rachel knows. She's like, didn't you read that? I'm like, uh, no, I, I read the first sentence. I got, got bored and <laughs> skipped the rest. <laughs> um, but, but you just, you have to, this is like the MCAT cars section on steroids you have to understand what you're reading you have to understand what you're getting yourself into and i understand yeah. the temptation right because i think people are like well doesn't it show my resourcefulness like in a real world if you were actually in a real world trolley problem you would probably try everything up to and including leading your body out of the train right mm -hmm. like i like in real life i would probably pick the one and then hope to heck i could find a way to warn them right but since yeah. the scenario is going to limit it because the scenario wants to do no how it, not all scenarios are like this but this scenario wants to know what do you do in a new wins no win situation right yeah. um and so yeah I, you want your resourcefulness to be more around thinking feeling questions not on secret solutions not embedded in the text yeah right i want everyone uh to go to youtube and type in the search the good place good the good place trolley car problem oh yeah <laughs> uh because or the trolley problem because the good place does an amazing job of working yes. through the trolley problem yep 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 in a pretty it's cool so way good. so just warning you now it can be pretty <laughs> triggering um there's gonna yeah. be a lot of trinoli scenarios and a fair amount of red splash um <laughs> want people to know going in <laughs> it, <laughs> what but, a great but yeah, show it, too it, it, it does really make awesome. you see it through um yeah uh do we want to tackle some of these questions that are coming in yeah so Mitchell says, I know sometimes I was not speaking clearly and sometimes had to take a moment to reflect on my thoughts. Is this penalized against in the eyes of the interviewers? Right. I don't think so. Right. No, I don't think so. There were times where I'm like, well, you're you're repeating yourself a little bit. But again, we're not expecting perfection. This is a very stressful situation. The interviewers understand it. So I, I think mm -hmm. I think you did great, Mitchell. Me too. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, agree. I, I understand what you're saying, that it was clear you were thinking out loud, but I liked that because I could tell yep. what you were thinking. Yep. I yep. would prefer that to some response that feels like I pre-prepared my answer and I'm trying to recite to you from memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Sarah asks, I have a virtual MMI coming up and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for group scenarios in a virtual setting. I've just noticed about myself that I tend to be quieter in a virtual setting because I don't want to cut people off and find the nonverbal cues are harder on Zoom. Yeah, nonverbal cues are much harder yeah. on Zoom and there's typically lag. And so when you're kind of trying to scan the all of the faces on Zoom and go, okay, I think it's my turn, somebody's speaking up and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't see anyone's face moving. It's, there's, there's lag going on. And so I, I think... Uh, you just do the best you can, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, Ryan and I have been working together for three or four years and we still struggle with it because we both get excited. So like, we'll think there's a lag or there is genuinely a lag. And then we both chime in and then there's a like, no, I think it's your turn to go first. No, you go first this time. Right. And and I think, yeah, as long as you're courteous about it and not just trying to roll over mm -hmm. someone no one will take it personally yeah. mm -hmm. also i mean every group interview is different but the feedback i keep getting from a lot of my students that have done group interviews is that the moderator ensures right like they will go down the line so there's going to be at least some times where they will call on you as they call on everyone right so maybe some mm -hmm. of it is free for all but they know that there's usually a dominator in every group and they don't want that person to be the only one who gets an interview so you will probably be given some structure to help ensure you have turns. Yep. Uh, and then Keza, Keza, uh, if you know that it will be default on the five when you do nothing, won't that technically still be a decision just like choosing to move? Yes, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that, yep. that is a, 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 a lot of people will say, I'm not going to change tracks right back to the original trolley scenario Perfect. i'm not going to change change tracks because that is me making the decision to change tracks but what they fail to realize is not changing tracks is also a decision right they're still choosing that love it uh beatrice should we introduce ourselves at the beginning of each mmi station yes i would yeah. mm -hmm. cool mm -hmm. all right let's rock and roll Uh, same one. We just did the I one. Oh, that's, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess because before it was just the actor based versus example. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. So we could do the president one. Yeah. Should we do this non acting, or do yeah. one of you guys want to be the president? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So raise your hand if you're interested in doing this one. Uh, non-acting, you are the head <laughs> of the transplant wait list and the president of the U.S. needs a heart transplant. He's asked to be first on the list. Do you let him enter the room and discuss with the interviewer? Mohammed went already. Yeah, we appreciate your bravery. <laughs> we definitely appreciate your bravery. But yeah, we'd like to make someone else go, Yusuf. Unless there's another Muhammad, since it is like the most common name in the world. <laughs> no, I think that was, yeah, Nahamad Nabil Farouk. I think that was our Muhammad friend as well from before. Yeah, Yusuf. Yusuf. All right, Yusuf. Yeah. Hello. Hello. All right, Yusuf. Hello. Long time All right, no Yusuf, talk. so I'm going to let you go back to the question yeah. list. Again, just answer this normally, but just we're trying to help you guys remember, so let you see this okay starting off i would have to say that this is definitely a very challenging interesting situation to be in as a head of transplant team um or the transplant list to be specific uh the first thing i would likely do is i would evaluate the list i would see who is listed on the list how long they have been listed on the list so are those cases who've been waiting for that heart were more immediate than the US president? I would have to think about the problem from two different directions. One being, this is the president of the United States who holds immense values of the country and his life potentially impacts the lives of many other people. Uh, but I would also have to think about the lives of the many patients who were probably waiting for months, if not, years on this transplant list. Um, I would definitely gather more information about those patients, get a better understanding of what that list looks like, 
I would also gather more information about the president's condition. Um, is it a very immediate heart transplant? Does he desperately need it to survive? Or can he possibly wait or be given an uh, alternative um, treatment that could keep him um, a little lower on the list and perhaps prolong his life a little bit longer? My stand on this issue is that I need to recognize that putting the president first is going to impact many other lives and potentially as important as the president may be. There are, it's also um, devalues the lives of the other people or the other patients who are waiting on that list as well. The potential issues with my stance would be the fact that many people would look at it in a political viewpoint and would say that you know, the president is the main and most important person in the United States, and he should be given all priority. But at the same time, I believe as a physician, every patient for you is your top priority. And all your other patients who have been on this list for, for possibly years are also just as important, maybe to their families and to their loved ones as the president is to the country and their citizens. So Scott? looking at it, oh, you're not done. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was just going to conclude and say okay. that I would I would go on by like gathering more information and making my decision off of that. But most likely, I wouldn't put him on the top of the list. Although I might rank him higher up if I was able to find an alternative treatment to kind of um, prolong prolong his health, essentially make him um, be able to withstand some more time on the list. Hmm. Scott, what do you think? So I have two comments, uh, Yusuf. Uh, the first comment I have is uh, that I thought you did a good job um, in general. You sort of explored, you know, some issues there related to the importance of the president to the country, but also the, the issue of just the value of human, the human individual in general and uh, not devaluing uh, a group of, uh, you know, others because of the uh, importance to, you know, in sort of a global way uh, of the president. Um, I, I probably would have tried to get, I, I understand where you were coming from in terms of exploring it all and then giving your answer. I would say maybe consider, uh, you know, an alternative way of doing that is up front saying, this is what I would do. And then you explore kind of the reasoning and what you would uh, be wanting to understand and everything. So you, so you don't wait until the very end and then go, okay, and this is what I would do after six minutes. And now the interviewer doesn't have any time to, uh, you know, ask a follow-up question or, you know, change the scenario somehow. So you might, you know, it, it, it's two different ways, but uh, you, you might, you know, kind of see what you think about that. The sort of more sort of uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention was unless uh, the prompt itself embeds into the prompt uh, a him or her always stick with they. Uh, you used him for the president the entire time. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think unless unless a question says him, just use they. Uh, I think it's a it's a a lot more um, reasonable and uh, doesn't ruff, ruffle any feathers. What if what if the interviewer in the room is a woman and you you know talk about the president as a him the whole time? What does that say about about her? So just kind of that's just a little thing, but I think it's, it, it it can sometimes carry some weight. So just kind of think about that uh, as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that feedback. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. All right. Great yes, this this scenario is specifically written him. Yeah, this one does uh, yeah. say him. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't realize. But just you know, kind of. It's a good point. Yeah. 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 All right. So we can take use of fan down. Where we're at. We got time for another one. Uh, yeah. Sure. I mean, do we? Maybe. 
Do we have another? I can't remember if this is, goes till five or five thirty. I think it goes to five thirty. Uh, that's all. That's all we have list we have here. So we'd have to pull yeah. from our additional list. Yeah, let's do some um, Q and A. So let's do some Q and A. Raise your hands if you've got general questions for us. You've got three pre med experts here: former physician, someone who's been in test prep and advising for twenty years, someone who's been a director of admission and the executive director of an application service. Pretty wide range stuff. Mm -hmm. um, just as a reminder for any of you who are in your application season now, you can use Mapped to track your applications if you need to track any secondaries you're still turning around or uh, track your interviews and your wait list. You can do all that for free in Mapped. And we also are offering one-on-one -on -one interview prep at a sale price right now. Um, so if you like the kind of feedback you're getting today and you wish you could get more of it in private, now is an amazing time to sign up for interview prep. Um, Ryan, do you know the, I can switch, I can switch over to the web. Right. Do you know the price point for the interviews right now, what the discount is? Uh, it's big. One million dollars. It's, it's two, <laughs> 250 for one, uh, 600 for three. Normally two is 700, so... Yeah, go check it out. Big savings. Yep. yep. Link link is in the uh, chat. Uh, sale ends probably next week. Uh, but we're we're monitoring the um. Yeah, we're kind of checking advisors the attendance. Yeah, depending on how they how they fill up. Um. But yeah, so all of the advisors are folks like Dr. Gray, Dr. Wright, and I, who have years as years and years of experience. So these are all people with senior level experience as deans of pre-health advising or senior offers of admissions. And yeah, normally $375 for one mock interview on sale for $250. The, uh, the best value, the, the three mock is normally $975. It's down to $600. That's an amazing deal. Mm -hmm. So you guys can sign up for those anytime. Um, so yeah, we could take questions from the chat too. It's always nice if you want to raise your hand and talk. I don't know if we've got any hands raised right now. Um, Veronica asks, I know it's very subjective, but what is generally considered a solid MCAT score? Um, better than 472, lower than 528? If it's not a liquid or gas? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, boom. Or plasma, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so Veronica, there's no easy answer here, right? Um, I've seen people get into med school with scores that are um, over 500 a lot. Under 500 is usually going to be a really big problem. But then there are a lot of people who get in who are in the 505 to 510 range or 510 to 515 range. So, you know, solid, what does that mean? Um I believe there was a statistic, I'd have to double check its reality, but a few years ago, about one, I think it, pe people who had at least a 3.5 GPA and at least a 510 MCAT tended to have one acceptance on average. But those stats don't tell the whole story, right? What they're not telling you is did that 510 person have three years of being a CNA or did they volunteer for five hours for one weekend and go, that's it, that's all the clinical I need? So I, I just pulled up... Uh... The AAMC table A what table is this? A23. Mm -hmm. Uh if you if you Google it. So these are people who have greater than a 517. I would assume they all thought their MCAT was quote solid, and yet 17% of them still didn't get in. Exactly. <laughs> right. At at the highest GPA level, highest MCAT level, uh, which is this position, right? So if you come over here, greater than a 379. 17% of these still don't get in. So what I think yeah. uh what I think Veronica is asking, right? What is a solid MCAT score? I'll I'll translate. Uh, I'll I'll be the pre-med translator. Veronica is asking what score will guarantee me an acceptance? There isn't one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what do we just see? Uh 83. 17% of people with 3.8 and 517 or higher got turned away because they didn't have clinical or they had clinical and they couldn't tell us a single thing about it. They said they said they loved research, but they could only tell me about doing Western blots. They couldn't tell me anything about what the research yeah. was actually studying. Yeah. So so Nick says depends on where you apply. 
uh, apply to. I'm assuming Nick, you're you're responding to the same question of MCAT and GPA. Um, I, I would challenge you on that, right? It doesn't it doesn't really matter where you apply if you're applying with the perfect MCAT score, perfect GPA, and a horrible story. You're still not going to get in, no matter where you apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maybe I think crazy. a lot of this is an old idea that you guys are bringing from college admissions mm -hmm. because there are more than 4,000 four-year institutions, colleges and universities, 7,000 if you count Bible colleges and, you know, graphic arts schools Barbershops. and hair design <laughs> schools, right? So, but if you're just talking about places where you can get bachelors, there's more than 4,000. So yes, stats are a big factor. Your GPA, your class rank, the number of APs you took, things they can quantify, your SAT, your ACT, those things matter because of the sheer number of applicants and the sheer number of schools dealing with all those applicants, right? But there are only 200 and some odd med schools in the United States. Um, so the thing is, is good stats are just expected. And good stat might mean 5.8 uh, uh, and 5.17, or it might mean 3.4 and 5.06. You just need stats that are good enough to show mm -hmm. you can handle the rigor of med school. But what's going to actually get you in is the same stuff that gets you in. If you look at college or safety match reach with med school in the United States, they're all reach. So-called uncompetitive med schools turn away 98% of their applicants. Everything is a reach. Yes, the stats matter. The stats are just a baseline foundation. Your story matters. Your activities matter. Mm -hmm. Yep. Love bit. Uh... Kezia, Kezia, what are the key skills to work on regarding preparing for MMIs that are different from the traditional interview format? Any specific differences to keep in mind? Rachel, I think you kind of talked about that uh, a little bit already, right? At the end of the day, communication and and just learning how to treat things uh, like real life kind of. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest difference is many MMI stations are going to give you a minute or two to think before you answer. And traditionally, in traditional interviews, the flow should go. So if you get asked a really tough ethics scenario question, you just need to jump in and start talking, right? It's it's okay to say, I need a moment at one point during the, the interview, right? But if you say, I need a moment to process after every question, then you're not really doing what the interview is supposed to do, which is just see what an a organic exchange of ideas looks like with you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just yeah. from a logistical standpoint, that's a big difference is you mm -hmm. don't get the 60 to 120 seconds to organize your response. Mm -hmm. So don't try to have a super organized response, right? Just talk. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, how late is too late to submit secondaries? When, when did you submit your primary? <laughs> when did you get that secondary back? Uh, there's there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, two to the three weeks is our recommendation, right? Yeah. After you get it. Yeah. After you get it. The DO timeline is a little bit different, a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. You have maybe a little more flexibility there. Mm -hmm. uh, after the deadline is too late. <laughs> Schools will have secondary deadlines and individual secondary um, return deadlines. That makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> Anisha, uh, how much does in-state versus out-of-state matter when building a school list as someone who moved states recently for grad school? How would that affect my application, if at all? Uh, Scott, you come from Texas, which is mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. in-state heavy. Mm -hmm. um, talk about yeah. in-state, out-of-state. Yeah, it, you know, it's going to vary my state in terms of what the rules are relative to what being an in-state resident means and how that's defined. Typically. Uh, you and, and this again, this is typically it may not be specific to your state, but I would say more times than not, you're not going to lose your residency by leaving the state for educational purposes. So, if, for example, if you if 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 my student went from Texas to Michigan to go to college, they're not going to lose their residency because they went to Michigan to go to college because they went there on a temporary basis to go to school. And their plan is to come back. Same thing would be to be true for for graduate school. It can even sometimes apply to uh, temporary employment. Uh, if your employment in a particular 
uh, a, a, another state is because of uh, is 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 seen as uh, temporary, and the employer indicates such uh, to to the uh, to the medical school. Uh, they're only here for a year doing a you know project or whatever. Then then that could uh, could uh, impact uh, that state residency issue. So generally speaking, it sounds like uh, Anissa that uh, I, it doesn't sound to me like you are, would, would be in, in a difficult position because of leaving the state for graduate school, but you'll want to check the residency rules for your particular state uh, to, to make sure uh, about that before you, uh, before you make any, you know, any, before you get too worried, I, I would say, don't, yeah. uh, uh, you know, check on it before you uh, freak out. Yep, yep. By the way, this freak out, I just said freak out. There's a song I hear on the radio all the time. It says, I'm freaking out that you're not freaking out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if y'all heard that song or not, but anyway, that's off the topic. Love it. Love it. I'm, Any I'm other not questions? Freaking out. I'm not freaking out. Why are you freaking out? Who's freaking out? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Romina says, do you have any particular advice for international students? Uh, by the way, I love your podcast. Um, international students, Rachel, anything special there other than harder because less schools? Yeah, harder because less schools. Make sure you've done your research on how much American education you still need to apply because uh, sometimes even when they take international students, they still want to see it, some American education. So make sure I'm not, you may have to go get more or it may just limit your schools, right? So just make sure you, you're not applying without checking all those technicalities. Um, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and yeah, be sure you're still getting clinical. Mm -hmm. Be sure you're still getting mm -hmm. shadowing here in the U S in the U S yeah. 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 American physician, like the day in the life of an American physician is very different than the day in life of a physician somewhere else. So mm -hmm. come, come see how the dark side lives. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> Beatrice asks for MMI interviews, how much time should we leave for follow-up questions? Also, should we always start by summarizing the main problem or is that annoying or unnecessary? So let's break this into two questions. Uh, I'll start with the first one, right? How much time should we leave for follow-up questions? I think you need to answer the question, uh, respond to the prompt in the way that you think you're supposed to be responding to the prompt without really worrying, oh, I need to leave X number of minutes left, right? right. Most of right. the time, you're gonna have a little bit of time left. And most of the time, the interviewer, the the person in that room with you is going to have a little bit of back and forth. I have heard schools that will say uh, that the, the students come back and say the interviewer did not speak. I stopped after three minutes and we just sat in silence. And I'm like, that sucks. But that's yeah, right. <laughs> um, so you just it, it, I don't Yikes. think you need to fill the time. You just need to to do what you need to do. Yeah. Um, what Six about summarizing? Is long. Yeah, it's it's very long. Yeah. Scott, what about summarizing? If someone comes in and basically just repeats the whole scenario in a Yeah, I don't I, Yeah, don't do that, but I I do think that if you enter into it and use the questions that we you know that we had on that slide, you're essentially doing that summarizing it as you're talking. Mm -hmm. You know, I I I say go into the interview and say hello, my name is is Scott Wright. Uh, today I'm going to address the issue of a trolley car and uh, what I should do. I mean, one sentence, uh, and uh, and then you can go into it. Uh, but uh, I, I don't. You don't want to summarize it. That's just wasting time. They know what the scenario is. You know what the scenario is. But uh, just kind of uh, just as a sort of easy way to to ease into the question, uh, you can just give a sentence and to say what you're addressing, something like that. Yeah, I, I have. I have an MMI book. I, let me let me run a poll here before I jump into to my answer. So I, I have this book, right? The Pre-Med Playbook Guide to the Medical School Interview. Uh, I'm about halfway through kind of working on it, updating some things. Uh, it needs more MMI stuff. So the question is, do I add MMI stuff into this book or do I make an MMI book? Doing an informal poll with you all here. Uh, I don't know what the right answer is. I could probably write a whole book on the MMI. Um, the, that question about summarizing 
uh, the 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 prompt. I have seen another MMI book that I I loathe their their structure. Um, the 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 format that they tell students to do is enter the room, repeat the scenario, and ask the the interviewer if they have understood the scenario correctly. <laughs> oh my just like, gosh, are you kidding do, me? Do not do that. I've seen it what so much from students. Earth? I'm like, I know what book you've read. And it's just no. like, I, I flip it around. I'm like, what you are basically doing is asking for a gold star that you have some amount of critical reasoning uh, ability or, or reading skills to to yeah. read a prompt and understand what it's telling you and then you're asking for a gold star hey before i start can you just praise me for understanding i'm like yeah. do not do that i would also find that is like very weirdly passive aggressive as i don't want to be accountable for my interpretation of the scenario i need you mm. to tell me i have the crate like i would be like why are you trying to get answers out of me we just got here yeah. You know, like I, so not only would that to me, does it seem like an inefficient use of time? It seems like an attempt at cheating, right? Yeah. I'm going to repeat it in my own words and see if I could tweak something that you like better, right? Like yeah. it doesn't, yeah. Do not recommend that as an introduction. Yeah. Uh, now that said, did someone read her book and try that way and still get into med school? Yeah, I bet more than one someone, right? So I think an, an important thing to understand here is these are all opinions, um, there is more than one right way to get into med school. If you really disagree with anything we're saying, you should trust your gut, right? Like uh, we're experts. And I think the thing that really makes us great experts is that we've helped thousands of students get into hundreds of med schools. So we're not trying to claim to have an angle on one school or one person. We're talking about what has worked for many people over the years. But also if there's something that doesn't sit right with you, please yourself, right? Um, but yeah, I, I feel like this should be much more professional, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the mm -hmm. asking me to confirm feels like homework. I mm -hmm. don't want this to be a teacher-student scenario. I want this to be an adult-to-an-adult adult scenario. I want to know how you're going to act as a future physician when you're your own, mm -hmm. you're accountable for your own ethics and your own decisions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Sadia says, can we start our response with, from my understanding, this happens and I would answer. I have no idea what that means. Yeah, I don't know what that means. No, I think, I think, I think Sadia is saying when, when you enter into the room, would you say, okay, from my understanding, I have, there's a trolley and if I pull this brake, then this happens. And if I don't pull this brake, this happens. So in this scenario, I would blah, blah, blah. Mm. Yeah. That's just summarizing what we just talked yeah. about. I don't think you need yeah. to. The the only time I've I've told the student like go for it. Number one is do it very quickly, and number yeah. two only do it if if you're using it as a crutch and you need to kind of have something to launch into your discussion. Mm -hmm. Ideally, yeah. you don't. But if you if you need it, go for it. If it still help and sticks your tongue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but just dive in. Mm. So we've what five minutes remaining. We can go early if you guys are done. Does anyone have any other questions for us about interviews, the MMI, our interview prep options, anything about the pre med process? Really? Would you recommend reviewing medical ethics before going into MMI interviews? You do not need to be a medical ethicist, but yeah, uh, it's it's always weird, Scott, when someone's like, "Well, according to uh, the law, the of blah blah blah." Ethics, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're you're not expected yeah. to to know that no, kind of stuff. No, no, no. I you know just I, I think the best way to approach it is a, one human talking to another human, mm -hmm. and you're you're exploring the scenario and just saying, you know, here's the scenario, and this is what I would do, and this is why, and. Uh, you know, don't you don't need to know that this is the deontological uh, philosophical position uh, trumpeted by Kant, Immanuel Kant, and blah blah blah. No. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, even knowing what the law is, right? Laws change, right? So, like, 
knowing the law yeah. on women's reproductive health is like a moving target right now because state by state is changing. Well, you're, you're not expected to be able to draw a map of the 50 U.S. states and show where abortions have gone up because the neighboring states ban them, right? Like, it's probably a good idea to know that's happening in general, but you don't have to recreate that map yeah. state by state, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for virtual interview interviews, would you recommend a blurred background? I personally hate blurred backgrounds. I think they're super distracting. Uh, I don't know, Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not a fan of them either. And again, that's a choice thing. But to me, it's like, what are you hiding? And I get that people want their privacy, but it's like, couldn't you just go to a corner of your house where nothing that you didn't want to share was visible? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, I had a student who just because of the angle of her window ended up sitting on a corner of her bed, but she sat up nice and tall and she had like a pillow for it for her web tap. So I knew she was on her bed, but it really just looked like she was sitting in her room with a blank wall behind her. You know, like mm -hmm. she managed to make that little corner of her bedroom as neutral as possible. Um, and so and to, that's kind of me, my advice. Yeah. To me, that's the key is, you know, my background right now is a horrible interview background. There's way too much going on. Because I don't think it's so. No, it's distracting because if you think about it, think about it this way. You're talking, 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 and I'm like, wow, that's a really pretty painting. I <laughs> wonder what the rest of it looks like. <laughs> or what the, what area of the what area of the globe is that globe turned to? You know, and, mm -hmm. or, you know, there's too many, too many things going on that's gonna distract me. And I'm thinking about that instead of thinking about what you're saying. So okay. I, I don't like very distracting things, you know, like Ryan, your thing. I see a Gators thing in the a, a helmet in the background, but I'm thinking I hate the Gators. It's a conversation so, piece. Sorry. It, I don't want to come to your yeah, school anyway. But, <laughs> but now I don't remember anything that you said because I'm okay. thinking about how much I hate the Gators. Well, and so for students, right, this is why when you ask questions, we often say it depends. So I think Scott's background is fine. I think Ryan's background is fine. I also have issue with Florida, but like, I'm just like, whatever. <laughs> I mean, he can't help it that his mother dragged him there as a child against his will, right? He's got this bias. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just mean like, I don't know if you look closely at my bookshelf, you can see Doctor Who. I don't think that, well, you can see the TARDIS. I don't think, I didn't think it was distracting. I feel like it's an Easter egg for those who want to notice it. Um, but, so there's, so I guess, yeah, Scott's saying don't be cluttered. I'm saying I think clutter is okay as long as it's not like in your face. What I don't want is to see your kitchen and see the half full bottle of vodka on the kitchen table. And I'm not, I don't care that you have a half full bottle of vodka. I, like take the two minutes to clean out your background right so to me it's mm -hmm. less about the clutter and like is there something I can see that is not professional like mm -hmm. would you let a bottle of dot vodka sit out on your desk at work if you worked in like a bullpen like probably not like probably you'd have it at least stashed in a drawer even if your boss was, was cool with you drinking in the evenings at work right it's not part mm -hmm. of the daytime experience um mm -hmm. So it's to me, it's that kind of stuff. It's just think about like, what are the posters that I can read? Mm -hmm. What are the things that I can see you consuming? Clean that mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to have bookcases in the background? I mean, I don't know. Well, I guess that's what you just said, Beatrice. I think <laughs> it is. Do you hate my bookcase? I like mine. <laughs> <Scott hates it. laughs> see i'm i'm the, i'm i'm trying to like figure out okay what books is she reading what's you know what's going on with those books and everything and while i'm doing that you're talking and i'm not listening to what you're talking because i'm trying to figure out oh i'm gonna google polaris yoga and <laughs> so we have what to that's account for about. your add that's what you're saying yeah you, absolutely <laughs> that is exactly what i'm saying Thank well you. granted i do want people to go <laughs> I want them to Google Maps more. That's why I get to right, right, right. <laughs> uh, Yusuf says, can you briefly go over the actor situations and how that would change or alter our responses compared to the non-actor cues? I don't think it changes or alters. It's just you're having a direct conversation with someone. And again, that's where mm -hmm. that empathy and listening and trying to understand yeah. comes into play. Yeah. You just have to put on your actor hat. You know, you have to, I think you have to sort of interject into the story, the scenario, some things that aren't there in order to, you know, 
you know, make it sort of play out in a, in a reasonable kind of way. So, mm-hmm. you know, for example, uh, the scenario may not give the name of the uh, of the person in the scenario. So if you're, if it's a clinical scenario and you're a, you're a medical student in the scenario, then you have to walk in and say, well, hello, Mr. Jones. It's nice to meet you today. Thanks for coming into the clinic. You know, I understand that you have some problems with your medication, blah, 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 whatever. Uh, so you may have to create some things that wouldn't be there otherwise to, to, to fill in uh, in this sort of acting kind of way. But you have yeah. to kind of put that acting hat on a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, personally, I think the acting hats are really good for forcing you to think through those kinds of questions, right? Because going back mm-hmm. to if it was the the eye surgery one, um, you know, Muhammad gave a very measured, thoughtful response. But sometimes students just open with, I'm going to go straight to our supervisor. And yeah. like, yeah. so in real yeah. life, you're going to walk right past your doctor friend who wants yeah. to sit in a room with you and talk to you about this. And you're yeah. going to say, I'm sorry, I'm you're not the person you. I want to talk to. I'm getting up and walking away from you to find your supervisor. You would not do that in real life. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. right. So it does really force you to think through what, what would a real human being do in response to a tricky situation as yeah. opposed to what's yeah. the on paper response. Right. Yep. Nobody likes a tattletale that holds true from, grade school to to uh the mmi um a tattletale without understanding first let's put it that way (laughs) cool all right well friends we are at time thank you so much for hanging out uh dr scott Wright. great to have you back for a workshop thank you Rachel grubbs uh if you all would like uh to work with one of our advisors one-on-one we have an amazing sale going on go over to medicalschoolhq.net click on that advising tab and check it out um uh, you'll get a replay of this uh, Mm -hmm. because you registered so i hope this was helpful uh good luck on your interviews And for those who aren't in the application cycle yet, we just reopened Application Academy as well. And we do tons of interview prep in Application Academy as well as essay uh, feedback and general Q&A, everything you need to submit an awesome application and be prepared for interviews. So we'll see you soon, friends. Yeah. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.